Hey everyone, this is a recording of This American Life, Chip in My Brain. We have gotten through a chunk of the podcast. We have about 20 minutes left, so please go ahead and listen to this podcast on your own with your sub, and uh, please follow along and then answer the questions that are on the said puzzle. We are going to lose him. Cody later said he had thought about killing himself. It seemed like it might be the only way to make this stop. Cody and his mom drove home together. It had been four years at this point. Four years of, as Cody puts it, trying to fix his own brain. Sometime after Cody moves home, his parents tell him there's something they need to talk to him about. They're pretty sure it's a bad idea, but they feel like they have to tell him because if he wants to do it, he needs to decide soon. It involved the court, and not a basketball one. They told Cody if he wanted to, he could try to sue AJ. It was a long shot. The law doesn't have a good way to deal with cases like this. After all, no one was kidnapped, no money was stolen. Cody says nothing physical ever happened. All they'd done was talk. And in fact, talk about religion, which is specifically protected in this country. It's in the Constitution. Cody's parents had done some research, and the best route seemed to be to sue for intentional infliction of emotional distress. The legal description of what they would have to show was daunting. The conduct had to be, quote, so outrageous in character and so extreme in degree as to go beyond all possible bounds of decency and to be regarded as atrocious and utterly intolerable in a civilized community. If Cody chose to do it, the whole thing could take years. Cody would have to be in a courtroom with AJ. He would have to relive the whole thing in detail in public while an opposing attorney tried to derail him. In the end, he might lose. Or put another way, A.J. might win. And there wasn't much time to think about it. Cody's birthday was, a, was coming in just a couple of weeks. And the statute of limitations was going to run out. So he would need to decide within the next two, two and a half weeks before his birthday. Cody thought about it. And one day before his birthday, he filed the paperwork to go ahead. There was over a year of legal wrangling, but this past September it went to trial. I was there for the beginning of it. Cody had all kinds of worries leading up to it. What if he had made all this up? He said that actually crossed his mind. Or what if, when he told all this to the jury, they thought there was something wrong with him instead of AJ? Cody had panic attacks in the days before the trial. It was like he'd slid backward. But he took the stand in front of the jury. The first day I can remember so vividly, we were in my we were in my weight room and (laughs) Cody's lawyer said this was a case of quote the secret manipulation and isolation of a young boy. He called what happened psychological torture. I looked at the jury, but they were impossible to read. They sat there totally expressionless. Cody was on the stand for over seven hours. But then his part was done. Would you state your name for the record, sir? Arthur Lawrence, Jr. And do you go by AJ? Yes. And here, finally, is AJ. He was neatly dressed, carrying a Bible, and yes, tall. Barely fit in the witness stand. My lower back is killing me. It's tightening up, and apologize for that. If you need more space, we can move those two notebooks, and that little table will fold down if that's helpful. Well, I meant like this entire wooden okay, thing. Okay, I can't remove all of them. No. <laughs> <laughs> How tall are you, sir? Six six. Okay, um, <clears throat> Mr. Lawrence, have you ever been uh, convicted of a felony? No. Have you ever been convicted of a misdemeanor? No. That's AJ's attorney there. He asked AJ how he'd grown up. I had great parents. Uh, Mom and dad raised me old-fashioned way. Uh, Respect elders. Yes, sir. No, sir. Yes, ma'am. No, ma'am. Private preparatory Christian education. Um, Pretty cool life. AJ went to college for a bit. Said he tried out for the NBA's developmental league, but didn't make it. 
So he became an athletic trainer, often teaching kids. He said families loved him. They were really happy with his work, including Cody's family. It went fantastic. I was um, a little bit shocked of Cody's ability to get things quickly and understand them, especially his vocabulary. Wow. Uh, how were his basketball skills when he started with him? He could dribble. I think when I first saw him, the first assessment I did with him, it was he dribbled like the most he was able to dribble consecutively was like three dribbles. He was not <laughs> good. And, of course, his lawyer asked about his religious beliefs. When did you first learn about the rapture and the tribulation? Sorry, kind of got emotional there. I just remember Miss Ward. Um, I really love that teacher. She introduced me that in Central Assembly in the sixth grade. About the same age Cody was when AJ started talking to him about religion. One of the big questions I had going into the trial was whether AJ had actually believed all the religious stuff he'd told Cody. One possibility was that AJ would just say, Yes, we talked about the rapture, the Illuminati, RFID chips, all that stuff is real. I was trying to save him. Cody pointed out that if AJ really did believe it all, why wouldn't he just testify to that in court? But that is not what AJ said. Cody's lawyer asked AJ about the Illuminati. AJ said yes, he had discussed the Illuminati with Cody, but not as a secret society that ran the world. I discussed it in the context that I do believe that there are fraternities, sororities that will cling together and assist others. And that possibly could be a society that he sees on the Internet known as the Illuminati. Of course, in his Skype messages, AJ said something very different. He really seemed to believe in the Illuminati. He wrote, quote, The Illuminati will kill you if you don't do as you're told. Give the system problems and you die or live with their mark. Cody's lawyer also asked about RFID chips. Over Skype, AJ had told Cody that chips cause you to lose mind control. Quote, it's imperative that you know what this chip does. Three exclamation points. But on the stand, AJ downplayed that. Didn't say the chips were the mark of the beast. He talked about them like they were just some new technology he'd read about online. I had found a link online. I believe it was done out of the University of North Carolina. And also there was another link out of uh, Alberta, Canada, I believe, that said there's biometric technology. It's here. It'll store your information, et cetera, et cetera, and all your stuff. Uh, would you be surprised if this was interpreted as something different than that by a uh, 14-year-old boy? After all this, <laughs> I'm not surprised now. Uh, I take it you're, by, by the way you're laughing about this, that you think it's funny that this was taken very seriously by Cody at the impressionable age you're communicating with? No. What I do take this very seriously. I mean, this is a court of law. What I'm implying, counsel, is before I didn't really think nothing of this, this Skype or anything, that it can escalate to this level because this... Where Cody said they had talked about religion for years, AJ said their conversations had been minimal, a matter of hours total. He said when they did talk about religion, it was because Cody had asked. Do you feel like you owe any apologies for the communications you had with Cody over the subject of this lawsuit? <sighs> Let's go ahead and just jump to the end of everything. I pondered on this, and I'm looking at all of this and the jury and everybody here, counsel. And I really wish I could turn back the hands of time and take in Mr. and Mrs. Treybig, Cody, to church a lot more so that they can see and they can understand that there are a lot of others 
in this world a lot of other Christians that share my same views and opinions about the Bible. So then they wouldn't classify me or label me as being a mean or evil person. This all took place in an old courtroom in Austin. I was struck by the smallness of it. There was basically no one in the audience. Very few witnesses took the stand. Cody, his parents, his therapist, and AJ. The main piece of physical evidence was those Skype transcripts, 25 pages long. This is the system we've come up with for settling disputes between people. We get a bunch of strangers together, the jury, who just have to decide what they think happened and how bad it was. Cody's lawyer, in his closing statement, said they weren't asking for a specific amount of money and damages. But he said Cody's therapist fees had totaled over $76,000. And the jury could add whatever they thought was appropriate for mental anguish. AJ's attorney, in his closing statement, said no one could know for sure why Cody was so strongly affected. Thousands or millions of Americans share AJ's religious beliefs, he said. Why don't we have mental hospitals filled with kids who are terrified of the rapture? The jury, still totally expressionless, recessed on Friday to deliberate. Was what happened beyond all possible bounds of decency? Was it atrocious and utterly intolerable in a civilized community? That evening, I got this voicemail from Cody. Hey, David. This is Cody. And, wow, um, we, we won. The, the jury came back unanimous. And I'm just so happy. I want to sing. I want to shout. I want to dance. I'm just, for so long, he was this mythical figure in my life that I couldn't touch. (sighs) It's amazing. And I'm the happiest I've ever been in my life. And that's all I can say. There is one thing Cody did not mention in that message the amount of the judgment. The jury awarded Cody just $4 in damages. Basically the minimum. $1 for medical care, $1 for mental anguish, etc. Which seemed weird. Like they agreed that AJ had done this thing that was beyond all possible bounds of decency. But when it came time to put a dollar figure on that, their answer was $4. We talked to five members of the jury after the trial, so I can tell you what happened. The presiding juror, who they picked to lead the discussion, and who happens to be a judge in real life, told me they started with a quick vote to see where everyone stood. Seven jurors were yeses, ready to hold A.J. liable. Three were undecided, and two were noes. So they debated and read through the Skype transcripts, and they took another vote. Ten yeses, two undecideds, both of them men. The presiding juror told me two things seemed to win over the last two. One was the mothers on the jury, who just kind of went to town. And the other was this idea of awarding just $4 in damages. And everyone kind of liked that idea. For some, it was a way to acknowledge that maybe A.J. hadn't known the harm he was causing. Legally, they only had to determine that his behavior had been reckless, not necessarily intentional. It seemed to some of the jurors that A.J. actually believed the stuff about RFID chips and all that. But for a lot of the jurors, the $4 was a way to help Cody put this behind him. Cody's family didn't need any money. And they figured if they picked a large dollar amount, yes, that would punish AJ. But he probably wouldn't be able to pay it, which would just drag this whole thing out. More legal stuff, maybe AJ would appeal, and everyone would have to go through this whole thing again. So, $4. I'm not sure that's how the jury was supposed to think about things, but it's what they did. After the trial, some of the jurors hugged Cody or came over to talk. One told me he also tried to find AJ to say good luck, but he'd already left. I usually think of courts as deciding who goes to prison or how much money someone owes someone else. Here it was doing something much more basic. Just saying who is right. Deciding for the record what actually happened. As I said, after the trial, AJ did finally agree to talk to us. Hey, David. Is this AJ? This is he. The thing I was most interested in was, what was it all about? Why did he say all that stuff to Cody? But in our conversation, AJ basically denied saying those things. He said Cody made it all up or exaggerated. 
He told me he stood by everything he said in court, 100%, and he's planning to appeal the ruling. So I took a different approach. Forget about what he said or didn't say to Cody. Did he believe those things? Somehow in court, no one had asked him that simple question. Uh, So can I ask you about RFID chips? Like in court, it seemed like you were saying you viewed RFID chips as just some new piece of technology to store data about you and that you'd sent Cody a link to some news story. But then in the Skype transcripts, Cody writes, what do they do to your body? And you write, you lose mind control. And also you have this whole discussion with him about what to do if his parents make him get an RFID chip implanted. Like, so, so which is it? Do you think RFID chips are just little computer chips or you think they're the mark of the beast that the Illuminati want to implant in everyone? How familiar are you with radio frequency? If you're in broadcasting, you should know quite a bit. <laughs> So tell right. me tell me something about radio frequencies. <laughs> tell me something that's useful here about radio frequencies. Well, the thing about it is you're interviewing me. I'm not interviewing you. I'm not here to educate you about radio frequencies. No, I'm just asking you, you a question. To... You, you seem to say that there's something important I should know about radio frequencies that would help me understand this. So, Well, let's, let's start off with what they are. Radio frequency identification is what it is. Okay. You have a credit card probably in your pocket, and it has a chip in it. Yeah. So is that all you think it is? Do you think it's the mark of the beast also, and that's something the Illuminati want to implant in everybody and will control your mind? Do you believe that? Well, first of all, in a court of law, that's I would object to that's called compounding. Okay. okay. Well, do you? So if you're going to ask me a question, okay, I mean, ask me a specific. Do but don't you put believe words in my that... mouth and don't lead me? Okay. Do you I, believe? I, I really wish you wouldn't do that. Do you believe RFID chips are or could be the mark of the beast? Uh, I believe that it could be a potential prequel to uh, the Mark of the Beast based upon what it says, what it states in Scripture. I told AJ what the experts told me, that this seemed like a one-on-one cult. He said he's not part of any cult. How do you feel about Cody now? Elaborate. I don't know. I mean, are you angry at him? I feel sorry for him. I feel sorry for him. I really do. I'm I'm really disappointed. I'm sad, but you know what? Life is about choices. So he's he, on judgment day, he'll have to stand before the father. And that's that's vengeance is that of the father. If you ask me what I make of all this, after listening to four days of testimony, reading through the trial documents, interviewing the family and other kids, and AJ for two hours, I think AJ believes all the stuff he told Cody. I found someone who knew AJ before all this, who said he talked about RFID chips and the Illuminati all the time, with enthusiasm. I think the appeal for AJ is the same as it was for Cody. It's a story he is at the center of. I think he's learned how to present it in a way that draws people in. And Cody was a sweet kid who adored AJ. I went to visit Cody after the trial. It did seem like the court case had put some final piece of this thing behind him. It was like Cody had gotten over his fear of the rapture and the Illuminati. But he still had a much more ordinary fear. He was afraid of a person. But in court, AJ did not seem supernatural. He seemed very human. You look at him and you say, you're just a guy. You're just a a person. Is part of why this was so powerful for you that uh, you lived for so long with this totally other version of how the world was? And here's a time where you finally decided what is real. And now you've shown it to a bunch of other people in in this very setting where we are supposed to decide what is real and what happened. And they said yes. That's exactly. That's exactly it. You look back and you just can't believe. You can't believe that the things you're saying actually happened. It's crazy stuff to me now. It's crazy stuff. And then it happened to you. It's, it's like, it's, 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 it's weird. I think those are the words of a fly, finally looking at the bottle from the outside. David Kestenbaum. He's one of the producers of our show. 